Copper is one of the most important, but also one of the most complex minerals when it comes to your health. And online, you can find many different opinions on copper. Some speak of copper toxicity and tell you to avoid it, while others say we're all copper deficient and need more of it. In this video, I want to clear up the confusion around copper. So we will talk about how to understand copper correctly and see through all the contradictory information online. The various copper protocols like mineral balancing, the Walsh protocol, the root cause protocol, or copper revolution, how they are different from each other and what they have to offer, and my recommendation what you should do to optimize your copper levels. But before we do all that, why even record this video in the first place? In recent years, more and more practitioners have come forward and identified copper as one of the key nutrients for optimal health. The problem is when you research copper online, you'll get a lot of contradictory information. For example, there are some people that tell you that you need to supplement copper to avoid a deficiency. And then there's others that say almost everyone is copper toxic and you should probably avoid it. Copper tests aren't that much better. For example, you could have a deficiency in your blood while at the same time having an excess on a hair analysis. And then there's all the copper related terminology like copper overload, copper dysregulation, copper toxicity, or copper dysfunction. How do you manage all that? And how do you navigate this copper rabbit hole without going crazy? So the first thing you need to understand is that all good nutrition protocols identify copper as having a key role in your health. And I already said this, most people make the mistake that they still only think about iron when it comes to nutrient imbalances or deficiencies especially when we're talking about anemia. But in reality, copper is what makes iron bioavailable. So you can have all the iron in the world. If your copper metabolism isn't functioning correctly, then all that iron won't do you any good. So the question really is, how do you optimize your copper metabolism? And for that, the key thing is really to understand the duality of copper. It can be a nutrient and a toxin, depending on the circumstances. Bioavailable copper is very important to health and bioavailable really just means that the copper in your body is bound to some sort of carrier protein. In most cases, this will be ceruloplasmin. Sufficient ceruloplasmin levels allow your body to use the copper, transport it around and put it to good use wherever it's needed in your body. It can then support your immunity, the aforementioned iron metabolism or your overall energy levels. On the other hand, we also have free copper that is toxic. It is not bound to any carrier proteins and just sits in the tissue and irritates it. That's because copper by itself is a really potent oxidant. So it can promote oxidative stress, which in turn can lead to disease and all kinds of symptoms. If you have a lot of unbound copper in your system, all the potential benefits I just talked about. So immunity, iron metabolism and energy levels reverse. That means you will suffer from a lot of infections, your iron metabolism will not work properly, and you will feel fatigued. On top of that, too much unbound copper can also mess up your neurotransmitters. That's because copper dependent enzymes affect the conversion of dopamine to noradrenaline. What that means is in practice, a lot of people who are copper toxic, so they have too much unbound copper in their tissue, suffer from things like panic attacks or anxiety. So all in all, understanding the duality of copper being either a nutrient that can benefit your health or a toxin that is detrimental to your health also helps us understand the different copper protocols. Let's start with the copper increasing protocols. So those that want you to take more copper, the most famous ones would be the root cause protocol and the copper revolution program. Both of them highlight the advantages of bioavailable copper. For example, among other things, the root cause protocol focuses on increasing ceruloplasmin. So it aims at increasing your copper transport protein to improve overall copper metabolism. And the idea is that ceruloplasmin will also bind to toxic copper in your tissue and will help your body eliminate it. The copper revolution program works a little differently, but overall it also focuses on copper's positive effects on your health and wants you to increase your intake of it. I generally like the detailed breakdown of ceruloplasmin and copper metabolism 
in these protocols. And I talk about this in more detail in my review of the root cause protocol. Unfortunately, focusing too much on corpus positive effects and just increasing ceruloplasmin can backfire. There are people with normal ceruloplasmin levels who still have biounavailable copper in their tissue. And many of them do a lot worse on copper increasing protocols because they simply can't tolerate more copper in their body. This then brings me to copper detox protocols. And the most common ones are mineral balancing and the Walsh protocol. I have video reviews on both of them, so make sure you check them out. Both of them focus on the health benefits of lowering the biounavailable copper in your system. Here, the idea is that as toxic copper is reduced, your organs, especially your liver, can produce normal levels of ceruloplasmin again. Now, depending on which practitioner you work with, they may sometimes recommend small amounts of copper supplements, but usually the focus is on copper antagonists, so those nutrients that lower copper in your body. This could be vitamin C, zinc, or molybdenum, for example. Now, I personally like the mineral balancing approach best because it's such an individualized program, but there are also people that have side effects with it. They often come down to the fact that both protocols, so mineral balancing and the Walsh protocol, work with very high doses. So they don't just have you take 10 or 20 milligrams of zinc, but sometimes upward of 70 or even 100 milligrams. In many people, this creates a scenario of copper dumping, where too much copper is pushed out of the tissue into the bloodstream, which then creates a lot of side effects. Anxiety, headaches, nausea, it can really be anything. Because of that, I recommend you work with a practitioner who doesn't recommend these super high doses and understands that many people simply don't tolerate them. You want to start slow, gradually increase your supplement dosages, and always monitor your nutrient levels. Okay, now that you have a general overview of the two main categories of programs, so the copper increasing protocols and the copper detoxing protocols, what should you do? Overall, I would argue that the two approaches really aren't that much different, because you always want to increase bioavailable copper and decrease biounavailable toxic copper. And this is also where seemingly contradicting test results come from. The most common one being a low copper value in the blood and a higher copper value in a tissue test like a hair analysis. I had this and the way to interpret this correctly is basically by understanding that a low blood copper level really just means that your body can no longer bind copper and keep it in the blood, so keep it bioavailable. Low blood copper levels also often come with low ceruloplasmin levels, so a lack of the transport protein. Over time, that biounavailable copper that you're still taking in through your diet will then deposit in a tissue, and that's where the high copper level on the hair analysis comes from. Another common thing is someone getting their hair analysis results back, and it shows a low copper value, but their practitioner still tells them that they're copper toxic. In this case, what's going on is that their copper is so deep within the tissue that it can't really be eliminated through the hair, so it doesn't show up on the hair analysis. The practitioner knows this by looking at other minerals and mineral patterns that always correlate with copper toxicity. In both cases, you need to come up with a program that takes into account your individual nutrient needs and copper tolerance. It also means you want to stay away from one-size-fits-all recommendations. So for example, someone telling you Everyone needs 10, 20, or even 50 milligrams of copper per day. Instead, my goal was it to take the best from each protocol and then go with that. In my case, that meant generally following the mineral balancing approach because that's the one that is most individualized and makes the most sense in my opinion, but still understanding and knowing the other protocols and then maybe taking something that makes sense for you. Just to give you a practical example, a lot of mineral balancing practitioners still recommend fairly high doses of isolated vitamin C, which definitely helps lower your copper levels, but it can knock down your ceruloplasmin at the same time. In such a case, a simple but effective adjustment would be to take some of the insights of the root cause protocol on increasing ceruloplasmin levels and then applying them. So instead of isolated vitamin C, you would take whole food vitamin C 
which has been shown to promote ceruloplasmin levels instead of knocking them down. Of course, that's just an example, and it doesn't mean you should never take isolated vitamin C either. It always depends on the circumstances. The key is really to not be overly dogmatic here and to familiarize yourself with the different programs to get the best insight of each. I hope this video helped you with that and I see you in the next one.